City Council meeting. I call this meeting to order at 7 o'clock. Let's all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, Madam Clerk, can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember James? Here. Mayor Pretend Leaks May? Here. Councilmember Mikulski? Here. Councilmember Polica? And Mayor Piana. Is he participating? Just one moment, Mayor. All right, try again, Court. Councilmember Polica? Present in Ferndale, Michigan. Um, all right. Uh, I think that is everybody, right? Um, and everybody, uh, Councilman Pollica is sick today and is participating remotely um, per the uh, guidelines by, offered by the state. Um, Recording in progress. <laughs> um, which goes into the electronic meeting procedures. We're still in a holding pattern until end, the end of the year. And uh, you'll give us an update in December about what's going on with the uh, Open Meetings Act and doing hybrid meetings. All right. Um, I did forget the approval of the agenda. Uh, we need an approval, a motion to approve the agenda, and there is one item for uh, removal of 7i. So I need a motion to proceed. Uh, just Seeking clarification, um, has there been a suggestion of removing that in entirely or moving it to a different portion? Uh, moving it entirely, um, uh, they're still waiting, staff is still waiting for information from the state, I believe. Your Honor, through the Chair, if, if 7I, the request would be to remove that from tonight's agenda uh, and table it to a meeting to be, you know, once complete information uh, has been provided from both uh, full circle communities as well as the state regarding the uh, grant request. All right, with that clarification, I move to approve the agenda as uh, published with the exception of removing item 7I from the consent agenda, um, tabling it to be returned at a later date, um, and moving item 7J up to 7I. Or uh, moved by James and seconded by uh, Mikulski. Madam Clerk. Councilmember James? Yes. Mayor Pretend Leaks May? Yes. Councilmember Mikulski? Yes. Councilmember Polica? Yes. And Mayor Piana? Yes. All right, moving on to presentations. Um, got a lot of great things to celebrate tonight. And on 5A is the award presentation honoring the 2020. Uh, I, guess I guess that's 2021, 2021. Uh, Ferndale Police Officer of the Year, Officer Kevin Jerome. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm going to ask uh, Officer Kevin Jerome to come on up here. Uh, you still, the camera's facing the back camera, right? It's facing us. Up. Yes. So we're, we're not trying to be rude, Mayor. Or we're just trying to, to face our audience. And I hear we, you. We can turn around. So. Uh, this is actually uh, the 2020 Ferndale uh, Police Officer of the Year. Okay. Uh, and tonight's, tonight's award, award presentation honors 2020 Ferndale Police Officer of the Year, Officer Kevin Jerome. This acknowledgement is taking place retroactively because 2020's Ferndale Elks Law and Order Night, the event that typically recognizes our Officer of the Year, was canceled in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our city employees continued their fantastic work through adverse conditions to keep our city services operating at a high level throughout last year. And we want to take this opportunity to recognize Officer Drone's great efforts. The Ferndale Police Officer of the Year for 2020 is Officer Kevin Jerome. We are extremely fortunate to have Kevin in our organization. He is a US Marine veteran and a Purple Heart recipient. He joined us in 2018 after working for the Detroit and Gross Point Farms Police Departments. Kevin has already become a field training officer and an evidence technician in his young career. In 2020, Kevin led the department and found on patrol activity and was recognized by Mothers Against Drug Driving as our Officer of the Year. 
which means that he had the most drunk driving arrest for the city of Fernando Police Department. Kevin leads by example through his hard work, dedication, and professionalism. Congratulations to Kevin on this well-deserved honor. I want to take a minute to recognize his uh, lovely wife, Jasmine. Uh, unfortunately, the, their two children aren't here, uh, but congratulations as well, Jasmine. Thank you for the support that you give Kevin. Thank you, Mayor Council. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your excellent service to the city. All right, moving on to more award announcements. Is 5B, is that we have announcement of the 2021 Employees of the Year honored at the Elks Law and Order Night, which was uh, last week on Thursday, November 4th. And we have the police officer, uh, firefighter, um, DPW worker, city hall worker, court worker, and the citizen of the year, as well as the senior citizen of the year. And I did want to uh, share all their names because I know you're going to come up and introduce them. Who is? I believe I have that, Mayor. This is Dan JC, Human Resources Director for the city. Hi, Dan. Good to hear from you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce this item. On Thursday, November 4th, the City of Ferndale's Elks Club held its annual Law and Order Night. It was a blast to say the least. During this event, several employees and one citizen were honored as employees and citizen of the year. We also honored a senior citizen of the year. This is a special award to our employees because the winners are selected by their peers. The speeches by the supervisors and employees were both inspiring and emotional. It was encouraging to see a mix of both new employees and veteran employees being honored. So I'm gonna shuffle through the slide deck here in a moment and bring up a picture of each of the honorees. When I do, I would ask the employee's supervisor to give a brief acknowledgement of that employee. And then we'll have the mayor say a few words about our citizen of the year and our senior citizen of the year. I am personally inspired by our amazing team, which includes Our police officer of the year. Is that my cue, Dan? It is, yes. <laughs> well, I'm happy to announce that our 2021 police officer of the year is Officer Edward Ungerman. Uh, I'll keep it brief, but Unger, Officer Ungerman uh, is a 25 year veteran of the Ferndale Police Department. He's a Ferndale High School graduate. He also graduated with a bachelor's degree from Michigan State. University. Um, he's married to his lovely wife, Kim, and they have two children together. Uh, his, oldest, her, his oldest is at Michigan State University playing in the band where Officer Ungerman played in the band for four years. Uh, Officer Ungerman and I uh, had the pleasure of attending the police academy together and we were hired one day apart. Uh, so Ed and I worked together for a long time. Uh, Ed is incredibly dedicated and he is a throwback to the old days of beat work policing. He's fantastic. He knows the city inside and out. If you wanna know what car belongs and what car doesn't, Ed will tell you. Do you wanna know where a dog belongs? He'll tell you. Uh, Ed uh, is a founding member of the Ferndale Police Honor Guard. He's a recently uh, a field training officer. He's also a member of the evidence tech unit. Um, Ed is very versatile and his experience is much needed as our, our, as, our, as our patrol force starts to roll over and becomes younger and younger. He, his experience has proved invaluable in bringing on these new officers. So I am proud to recognize Officer Ed Ungerman as the Police Officer of the Year for 2021. Congratulations, Officer Ungerman.
And now the firefighter of the year. All right, so our 2021 firefighter of the year is Evan Chevella. He is a newer firefighter with two years on the job, but he has really come in and learned a lot through his probationary period and it's just it's rose to the occasion. He's a perfect example that leadership is not dependent on bars on your collar or years on the job. That leadership can happen on day one on the job to your last day on the job. He comes to work every day. He has an infectious smile, amazing attitude, inspires everybody around him. He's big into physical fitness. He pushes everybody to be better. Um, comes up with activities throughout the day for even their chores to do them in their firefighter gear on air just for conditioning of doing that type of work. He's always striving to just push everybody a little bit harder, be even better. Firefighters blow him, thank him, and actually credit him for their success in their probationary program because he was there to inspire, help, teach. And he's only a couple years on the job. So he is just really showing um, great qualities, characteristics, and one of those things that we want in all of our people that they understand leadership is not about rank. It's about how you can inspire each other each and every day. And he, like I said, he, he's always joking and I could be having a stressed out day and if he's working, I know I'll be smiling after I leave the room that he's in. So that's how everybody feels. So he's a great asset to our department and I'm thankful to have him. And he was again chosen by his peers. Good evening tonight, Mayor and Council. Um, on Thursday at the Alps, I had the pleasure of announcing William Lucas as our 2021 DPW Employee of the Year chosen amongst um, our crew down there at the DPW. Luke has had a 31 year tenure here with the city of Ferndale working for the DPW. So he has had the opportunity to do just about everything uh, in our department. Luke is one of the most humble, grateful, caring individuals I've had the opportunity to meet. He's always got a smile on his face. He is just a all around great member to have on your team. And it was such a pleasure and honor getting to present this to Luke. And, you know, our entire team was extremely happy for him to be receiving this award as it was very well do with the dedication that he shows to this community and to our team. And if you can't tell by this photo, he's probably one of the most dapper individuals you will ever meet. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I, I just hope that I can have an ensemble and be as well put together as Luke someday. So um, it was a pleasure getting to introduce Luke and, and present him with this award. Congratulations, Luke. All right, we've got the City Hall Employee of the Year. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is Jordan Twardy here, CED Director for the City of Ferndale. Uh, and I was honored to be able to present the uh, award for City Hall Employee of the Year uh, at the Elks Dinner to Kathy McClintock, our permit tech. She is the longest serving and most experienced member of the CED team. She's been with the City of Ferndale for over 20 years. She's actually a third generation employee of the City of Ferndale. She's had two uh, relatives that came before her actually served as firefighters. So strong legacy in her family uh, of serving the city of Ferndale with honor and dignity and uh, confidence. She is, as our permit tech, the force in our department, keeping contractors, tradespersons, inspectors, uh, all in line and honest and focused on the tasks at hand, coordinating all of those inspections from uh, something as small as a deck addition to something as large as an apartment building. Uh, she serves with poise, she's endured uh, staffing changes, technology changes, development waves, uh, all of it with grace and all of it with empathy and skill. And uh, it's just truly an honor to be on a team with Kathy and uh, uh, contractors, residents alike, anybody who's interacted with our permit process uh, to schedule an inspection has come to know her uh, and trust her expertise. So uh, really, really great honor to present this to her and I'm so proud of her and grateful that she was chosen by her peers uh, for this award. Congratulations, Kathy. 
So I don't think anybody is here from court tonight. So I'm going to give just a minute in case somebody is, and then I'm going to chime in. Uh, there's no one here tonight, so go ahead. <laughs> During the award ceremony, the Elks played a pre-recorded message from Judge Longo about their employee of the year, Michelle Buckman. It was both funny and heartfelt. It is obvious that Judge Longo and the court has a deep appreciation for Michelle and that she's a valuable member of their team. Thank you, Michelle, for all that you do. Congratulations, Michelle. Um, and I had the uh, distinct honor of awarding the Citizens of the Year uh, to Alan Heal. Um, definitely had support from City Council to extend this award to Alan who is the chair of our Accessibility and Inclusion Advisory Commission, which started, uh, restarted again after 20 years in 2019 under former Mayor Dan Martin. Um, Alan has been a, um, what I call a calm, passionate, and compassionate voice, um, really advocating for disability rights. Um, not only in his job as a GM electric vehicle and autonomous vehicle, engineer, but also um, here in Ferndale and how we design our community so that everybody feels welcome, can get around and ha uh, um, have accessible access to our businesses, parks and everything. And Alan has been really a, a driving force in our master plan, our non-motorized plan, and helping the city revisit our policies um, going forward. And he has just always been a, a very a good sounding board, um, not only I think to council members, um, but to the community as well. And I just really appreciate Alan stepping up and lending his talents to the city. And um, congratulations, Alan, and for all of your help and look forward to more uh, changes that you will propose going forward. So congratulations, Alan. You cannot be here tonight. And, and then finally, uh, we have the Senior Citizen of the Year who was nominated by the Senior Board as well as um, Jeannie Davis, who is the president of the Seniors Group. Um, Sheila has um, been a longtime member of the Senior Group, and she is seen as someone who keeps the Senior Group together. It's a source of inspiration um, and always there to lend a hand um, shared her story of recovering from cancer and overcoming um, the challenges um, faced with that and then being part of the inspiration with this senior group. And we're just so grateful that um, Sheila is involved and um, specifically in the last year was very hard on our seniors um, through the pandemic. So congratulations, Sheila, for um, your, your recognition in the community. All right, um, and thank you everybody for contributing to our greater conversation. We're moving on to the final presentation, which is an update uh, of 5C update by Oakland County Commissioner Charlie Cavell. Commissioner, are you here? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Thanks for being here tonight. Hey everybody. Um, so first, congratulations to everyone that won. So Officer Unkerman, Firefighter Shavella, Mr. Lucas, Kathy, Michelle, Alan, Miss Jackson, congratulations all of you, way to go. Uh, just a couple of quick updates from the county. First, I'm gonna talk about uh, brownfield redevelopment and tax increment finance policies that the county is going to be changing up and hopefully uh, starting to meet the needs of the people and emulating the great work that y'all are doing in Ferndale. Second, talking about housing. And then third, talking about criminal justice because these are some of the big things that the commission will be voting on at our full board meeting of all the commissioners on Wednesday evening. So first with Brownfield and tax increment finance, uh, we realize that we need to update our policies and procedures so that they can be more focused on climate resiliency so we can have more responsible bidding and contracting to help union shops. And then also we need to think about inclusive housing and making sure that's available when the county is part of the Brownfield redevelopment programs, since we are using taxpayer money to help further those options. Second, talking about housing, I wanna first give a shout out to the community and economic development staff who's been very helpful in advising us on this. Uh, one of the big things that they brought up in conversations we've been having around how to use the federal government money 
that we've gotten. Oakland County has $244 million to figure out what to do with. And we've been trying to settle on a couple of housing priorities. One of those after talking with the CED team here in Ferndale and also the county executive was uh, proactive code enforcement. So we talked to the housing department just uh, earlier, I guess just last week, and they loved the idea. So congratulations, you know, Ferndale CED department for giving us a great idea. Uh, Want to make sure you get the credit for all your work. So thank you for that. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to pass something quarter one of next year and you'll see the changes at the city level soon thereafter. Uh, and then moving on to the last thing, criminal justice. On our agenda for this Wednesday, we're gonna be having uh, drug court renewal. And then also we'll be having something that I'm pretty proud of as our county commission. I worked on closely with a bunch of people that live here in the district, including a couple of folks in Ferndale on creating a mental health treatment court. Uh, so that's gotten a grant and then also some funding through the county budget. So both of those things have come together and we're gonna be voting on it on Wednesday. So hopefully it passes and we can create a jail diversion court program at the county level. And then also uh, there's a joint task force between Oakland County and the Southeast Oakland SWAT teams uh, that came up for a funding request and Ferndale is a part of that. And that passed out of committee with flying colors. And so I imagine we'll all vote yes on it again. So Chief Emmy, uh, I hope you don't have to worry about that one. Uh, that's what I got for this week. Um, thank you for being here. I do have a follow-up question for you unrelated to anything you just talked about um, because uh, ARPA money is really big and I was wondering how the county is um, going to deploy your ARPA dollars because you got what, 215 million? Um, how do you think that will be deployed and when do you think that will be deployed? You know, that's a great question. So uh, just to give context to everyone who may not know about this. So, uh, right, COVID happened and then uh, the new administration in DC took over, right, Joe Biden's president. And from day one was talk about this ARPA thing, American Rescue Plan. We got to do this. So starting like January 20th, we at the county started talking about it. It passes in April. And then in May, we get the first check of $122 million. And then the county, I kind of guess, kind of got busy, you know? Um, so we've kind of had conversations here, conversations there, um, but we will be having something of a retreat, a caucus meeting on November 9th, so tomorrow, and then also on November 10th to in earnest figure out broad-based buckets of what the county commission would like to do with that money. So out of the $244 million we've received or will be receiving because it comes in two checks. So we got 122 this year and we'll get 122 next year. So out of 244, we've already spent or allocated through the budget process earlier this year, 200, or 44 million. So we have 200 left out of the 44. So there are a bunch of that went towards government operations, updating services and facilities and tech and also a huge investment in mental health and nonprofit support grants and also business emergency support grants. So that's what 44 million has gone towards. The 200 we have left to figure out, we will suss out or at least begin putting into five or six buckets tomorrow. So great time with that question. And those five or six buckets are infrastructure and sustainability, housing and basic needs, um, cities, uh let's see what else water and sewer infrastructure and then the last one is government operations okay. so we're going to figure out what we think and then once the commission has that we'll talk with the executive and see what they think and compare notes okay thank you for, for that yeah. update and where you are in the process i guess if anybody has any uh, suggestions about how they should allocate that money to cities um, now is the time to send your suggestions to our commissioner mm -hmm. Um, or give them a call and share your thoughts. All right, well, thank you so much, Commissioner, for being here. I really appreciate the update. All right, uh, we are now moving on to call the audience. Um, we set aside 30 minutes uh, at this portion to uh, hear from our residents um, on any topic on or off the agenda. Um, I ask everybody to uh, Come up to the podium if you are in the city council chamber and if you are joining us via Zoom, we go to the blue hand raisers after talking to everybody in the chambers and then those who are calling in 
as well, and our assistant city manager, Kyle, will be managing all that. Um, so we ask you to uh, limit your comments to three minutes and uh, address the issues and uh, not people. Um, city staff take direction from council um, and the mayor. So um, with that, I open it up. Is there anybody in the audience in the chambers tonight who would like to make a public comment? Good evening, Ms. Mrs. Chess, thanks for coming. Hi, I'm Sharon Chess, and I want to start off by saying last time I was here, when I left and got in my car on a blustery, wet, miserable night, my wallet fell out of my pocket into the street, and about 11.30 at night, a hard knock came to the door. Fortunately, I was just watching TV, but it was a police officer um, handing me my wallet filled with my credit cards, my cash, and my Cheesecake Factory gift card, which I cannot <laughs> get rid of. Um, and I'd love to like re-gift that thing. Um, so I want to you know, thank whomever found it and turned it in. It was welcoming, it was surprising, and I didn't even miss it until that knock came to the door that evening. So thank you, whoever you were. Um, just a comment about Mr. Ungerman. Um, Ed Ungerman is also on our Ferndale Community Concert Band and plays the trumpet in the FCCB. And he plays the, no, he plays a French horn in FCCB and the trumpet in M1 Jazz. So he's still very much connected to Ferndale. His mom still lives in their family home. And if I um, remembering correctly, I believe the bus station is named after his dad or his grandfather. So the Ungerman family is definitely a part of the fabric. And I'm so glad he was well deserving of the police officer of the year for 2021. And then I wanted to congratulate Kathy for being recognized because her and I, I think we're the only two recognizable faces in here. Everybody else is newer. She's been here as long as I've been. So it's nice to come in at least now Kathy recognizes me for my rental inspections, our building permits, and whatever other issues. Her and Marnie are the only legacy people here at City Hall that have been here as long as I have. So they've both been great help through our business and any of our personal needs. So thank you on that. Um, and then one other thing, when we had council last um, time, we spoke a little bit about the um, issues that are going on with the Kulig Center. And I have an idea for that. Um, I've done my due diligence. I've had a lot of conversations. The Kulig Center has been the community center for almost 20 years or 20 years. It's never been the perfect community center, but it has served us as best as it can. So my idea is that the community center is an asset and it is a plus here, mostly for our seniors because that's where they meet, that's where they do their events, that's where they, we have the warming station or the cooling station and it, it really is an asset to our seniors. And I think when push comes to shove, that it is worth the city investing in those repairs because it's a selling point to have a senior center and a community center. And then in your grand master plan, I would like to see you plan for a genuine community center where Parks and Rec can hold multiple classes, where the classes can be bigger, where everybody who wants to instruct a class has available class space to do that where the FCCB may be able to do their performances at and all of the other artists in our community. So I hope that you look seriously at redoing Kulik Center and creating a wonderful senior center out of the Kulik Center and, and do that and then create another area where you can have a wonderful parks and rec department and a performing arts department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Are there any other members of the audience? Uh, come up to the podium, please. Good evening. Good, hey evening. Good evening. My name is Stella Dichenko. I live in Fendel for 24 years. First of all, I'd like to congratulate 
Laura Marklowski, you have got most voice, most votes for your campaign. And uh, if you run for mayor, I believe 84% missing votes will be yours. Uh, the existing administration planning to keep putting our community into permanent financial debt. The Pianus bike lane project will be finalized in more than two years. It means the next mayor will be the one who will be blamed and will be taken by state, uh, like they did for Detroit, when the city of Detroit went to for, for bankruptcy. And because existing one is going to move next level for political career, unfortunately, it won't be untouched. This is why me and my friends and people who love Ferndale and want to save, we just want to call new project in St. Uh, Woodward, Diet, Avenue Diet, will give a name, Pianos Pride Lanes, because everybody, regardless good or bad, it will be outcome, will be a member who is behind this. And being honest, I already sent to Lansing a uh, signed petition by local businesses. Just to inform, because that petition was signed and collected after our mayor official told everyone that Every owner of business on Woodward and on 8, 9 Mile informed and agree with the project. Over 30 people signed against. And uh, we had here Mr. Walder, one of the business person, who came and had a speech, and he just was basically ignored. Everybody heard him, but no any response came from uh, administration. And it's Disrespectful, this is what made me to jump in an uh, election, just because I wanted to serve our people, not use them as a step stone for my future career. Because somebody is going to move out of here in two years thinking they are doing better and step on our head. I'm not going to let it. I just let you know I'm starting my personal uh, war to save our city from being over financial in third world, world or over. We are not going to do this, and we are starting our fight. It will be include all higher level administration. We are not going to end that. It's done. OK, uh, next. Uh, is there any other people in the audience who would like to make public comment? Seeing none, uh, we're going to move to Zoom. And uh, Kyle, any hand raisers tonight? Yes, Mayor, we have. Marianne Mielski. Hi, Marianne, welcome. Hi, good, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Marianne Bielski. I'm here with my husband, Tony Bielski. We own Tony's Sports Bar at 23500 Woodward. Are you able to hear us? Yes, it's good to hear your voice, Marianne. Great. Well, um, you, you have before you a resolution that would allow an extension for outdoor cafes and temporary structures through the spring of 2022. We're in favor of that. The city staff and the DDA generously supported us through the most turbulent times of COVID. The pressures of safety measures, exorbitant food costs, reduced open hours, and limits of capacity made our survival difficult. The value of your support was instrumental in our survival. We were given safety supplies. We were recipients of grants that provided greenhouse structures and propane heaters. You opened up restrictions to allow outdoor service and waived fees. All while your members kept a watchful eye supporting us whenever they could. We're not yet fully recovered. COVID continues to influence our daily routines. The effects of the virus still discourage patrons from visiting and eating indoors. And having the option to be outdoors is noteworthy. We would like you to please consider the resolution and vote favorably. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, for your comments. Next, Mayor Megan Davenport. Hi, Megan. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? 
Oh, you're, you're not, not Megan. Megan. <laughs> Sorry, I'm at home. Um, <laughs> uh, with whom am I speaking? This is Bryce Davenport. I'm with Hometown Restaurant Group. Uh, Hi, former... Bryce. <laughs> Welcome. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on the previous speaker. Um, I'm just calling on behalf of Pops for Time and One Eye Betty's and just asking for uh, the city's understanding about you know allowing patios. Um, uh, more specifically at one I Betty's, um, just with COVID and the restrictions and being able to have uh, the ability to seat 50 people on a patio, whether it's creating an environment through outdoor seating, it's just something that we would really like the city to, to think about and approve and, and let us um, kind of keep that space. Excellent. Thank you for your comments and uh, joining us tonight. Appreciate it. Um, and next, Mayor, uh, one of the members of the MLUP Steering Committee, Lynn Clark. Hi, Lynn. Hi there. Can Thanks you guys hear me? Okay? Yep, you're you're ready to go. Um, this, this is, is weird because I'm normally on a different Zoom, but I just saw this happening. So I've had something that I've wanted to talk to council about for a while. Ever since the bike lanes went in on Pinecrest and I live on Pinecrest, it's kind of been, uh, it's, it's very unsafe feeling to drive. Backing out of my driveway is difficult. And I fear for the students that are like first time drivers. And I think the we should lower the, uh, speed limit on Pinecrest. If you're gonna put in bike lanes and put cars so close together because of those lanes, it, I mean, I've been driving and I, I admit I'm not the best driver in the whole world, although I'm 60 years old, turning 61 soon, but I think 30 miles an hour in a school zone is ridiculous and now that we have the bike lanes, it's, it just feels so unsafe. I see kids all the time darting across the road. And when we had the, uh, the band and they won like whatever and people were out in droves, people don't pay attention and they dart across the street and there's animals that are hit. And it just feels so unsafe now. And I get the advantage of bike lanes on Pinecrest. It makes sense to put them there, but it does not make sense to have it 30 miles an hour. So, and a, my husband doesn't even agree with me on this, but I think it should be lowered to 25. And I don't know the procedures to do that, but I, I think in front of a high school and middle school with bike lanes, it's, very concerning that it it feels so incredibly unsafe to go that fast. And I never ever go faster than 30 miles an hour and I don't feel safe driving 30. But if I go less than that, I have cars like on my, I don't wanna say a bad word, but on the back of my car, like riding me all through like Pinecrest up to nine miles. So, and when you get to nine mile and you get into the rest of Ferndale and you cross over, it, it lowers to 25. So it's not a big ask to lower the speed limit on Ferndale's uh, Pinecrest uh, uh, road to 25 miles an hour from eight mile to nine mile. And I'm not sure how to ask for that. So I'm, I'm asking you, the city council, how do we go about changing the speed limit on Pinecrest? Thank okay. you. Um, great comments. And I'm gonna defer that to the uh, city manager as well as um, our traffic control. Um, and I know that would be in consultation and partnership with the school district as well as they're a stakeholder in that. Um, and I think there's definitely a, a a way forward to have those conversations and explore uh, reducing um, the, the speed limit. 
So you've made your request and we've heard you. So I wanted to acknowledge that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, Lynn. And that's everyone, man. All right. Um, there are no more blue hand raise. Oh, there is someone else in the audience. Uh, welcome. Do you want to go to the, the dais, please? Hi. My name is Jamie D'Angelo. I wasn't sure when I was supposed to speak on this. I own New Way Bar at 23 130 Woodward Avenue, and I'm here to speak about the uh, sidewalk cafe licenses as well. It has been a, a tremendous help keeping people spread out, uh, giving them a, a space to go outside uh, through this whole thing, and I, I would hope we could continue that this winter. Um, it would really help, and... and um, that's that's all I can say. It's Excellent. been a big help, and I appreciated it last winter, and I hope we can do it again. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you for being Thank here. You. All right, folks, seeing no other comments uh, in the chambers and or online, I am going to conclude the call to audience and move on to the consent agenda, um, item seven on the agenda, and I'm going to read it in entirety. And um, knowing, noting that 7I has been removed and tabled to the next city council meeting. 7A, approval of October 25th, 2021, regular special meeting minutes. 7B, consideration of payment to the state of Michigan for the community public water supply annual membership fee, the amount of $5,863.16, and the expense charged to water sewer fund membership and dues. 7C, approval of ESO software platform modules expansion for a total initial cost of 12,817.50 sets, includes setup and training, and then 8,000 for annual recurring costs. 7D, approval of the fire hose purchase replace inventory in need of replacement for a total cost of 3,632. 7E, approve of the contract with Lawn Clippers Yard Services to provide snow removal and lawn care service to qualifying low to moderate income residents via community development block grant. CDBG. 7F, approval of the contract for snow removal and yard services administration with the Oakland Livingston Human Services Agency using community development block grant CDBG funds. 7G, approval to spend parking enforcement for the downtown parking system for Small Business Saturday scheduled for November 27, 2021. 7H, adoption of proclamation recognizing November as Native American Heritage Month and 7 J, guest now 7I, approval of the bills and payrolls as submitted by the city manager's office and subject to review by the council finance committee. What is the pleasure of city council? Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Support. Moved by Councilwoman James and su supported by Mayor Pro Tem Leek May. Uh, Madam Clerk. Mayor Pro Tem Leek May. Yes. Councilmember Mikulski. Yes. Councilmember Pollica? Yes. Councilmember James? Yes. And Mayor Piano? Yes. All right. And now we have um, 8A on the regular agenda. Moving on. Consideration to adopt the 2023-2027 Capital Improvement Plan as recommended by the Planning Commission. And, and who do we have introducing that tonight? Ah, it's Kyle, our Assistant City Manager, Kyle. Do you have a presentation tonight? Yeah. Of course you do. Of course you do. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, tonight we're bringing you the Capital Improvement Plan, uh, which is a five-year plan that is updated each year. Uh, it will be presented by myself, Assistant City Manager Kyle Paulette, and our new assistant to the City Manager Janicia Woods. Uh, briefly, here is what we will go through uh, with plenty of time to discuss at the end. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, so for our CIP team this year, we had um, our Assistant City Manager Kyle Paulette 
um, Fire Chief Teresa Robinson, our police captain, David Spellman, DPW Director, Dane Antasic, um, Parks and Rec Director, Lorena Wheeler, uh, Facilities Manager, James Jameson, GIS Tech, Dave Bovilla, and myself um, on our CIP team. And then we also had the help of um, Greg Pollica and Krista Azar. Uh, so before we really get into it, I wanted to put a slide up to clarify some of the things that as we discuss, uh, we slide into the weeds sometimes. And so this is my what it is, what it is not. Um, I'll start with what it is not because that's more fun. It is not a budget or obligation to allocate funds to any project in the CIP. Um, it is a, uh, well, I guess I'll go back a bit. It is a list of projects by staff that are based on the threat plans adopted by council and written by the community and then also the operational uh, materials and equipment needed to serve the community. It is not a detailed project charter or timeline uh, aside from the years that the funding is requested. Um, it is a list of price tags um, as best as we can estimate at this point, but again, it is not 100% accurate and there are no um, details present in the plan. The details on each project would be appropriate uh, during the budget cycle. We are required to uh, pass this every year, uh, which includes a night before the planning commission where they accept and recommend council then adopts. And it is our uh, first step in the budget cycle, and I'll go into that further. But I also wanted to clarify the CRP adoption absolutely does not put council in a box. It is what we know to be true right now, but as you all know, these things change drastically very, very quickly, and ultimately the uh, allocation funding powers are all yours. Um, so let's talk about a little bit what uh, a capital improvement project is. Um, so it is new infrastructure, vehicles, infrastructure rehab, any equipment that's $10,000 or more, um, any CIP plans that are $10,000 or more over three years, um, any plans that are $25,000 or more, and any land purchases um, that are $25,000 or more. Um, and uh, where do the funds come from? They come from our bonds, Act 51 Sanitation Fund, our Drug Forfeiture Fund, um, CDBG, Water and Sewer Fund, Auto Parking Fund, and our General Fund. Um, as far as the timeline for the CIP, um, we start in September where the department submits their um, applications. And then October, um, the CIP team reviews those applications. November, the CIP goes to the planning commission and um, the city council adopts the CIP. And then um, December, we have a mid-year budget adjustment. And then February through May um, is the 2023 uh, budget prep and adoption. And as I said, the CFP is our first step in budget cycle. And um, I was uh, recently 
asked, you know, how the timing works. And when I started, the CRP had generally been adopted, I think, in the new year of the budget, right, Joe? So after December. And the reason that we used it, uh, first I bought one in December when I first got here, and then now in November is because uh, for city staff, December, January really starts our budgeting process. And we have to go into the budget and adjust uh, for the mid-year. And then when January hits, we are already starting meetings and discussions on setting the next year's budget. So it's mainly for administrative uh, process. Um, last year, City Council adopted the program-based budgeting initiative, and we took this and we built it right into the CRP by making every project aligned with a any program which had a score assigned to it through the PBB process. And the scores are based on how vital is the program to the continuation of essential city services. It is not a value judgment on a program. And so a lot of times you will see uh, park improvement with a lower score. That's not because it's not important. It's because it's not a vital service to our legal required uh, uh, services. And then I also wanted to mention that we were the uh, recipient of an award from Resource X for our work in PBB, making our CIP uh, more um, transparent and understandable uh, to folks that don't do this every day. And that was in our first year of PBB, so pretty good. Um, so the breakdown of the table um, starts with number one, where we look at strategic versus operational projects. Um, and strategic projects are projects that align with the specific goals set by city council and operational projects provide the tools to complete those strategic projects. Um, and then in the number, the column number two, um, are the department um, program. So it's the program that's most closely associated with the CIP project. And then the column um, number three is the PBBI score that um, Kyle just talked about based on program impact to service the community. And then the fourth um, column is um, the plan, which indicates which strategic plan the project appears in or directly supports. Um, I think it's important to um, talk about how we used to um, rank our projects in the CIP. Um, so in 2019, we did must have, could have, should have. And then in 2020, we did vital to the program, assist or expand. Um, and we noticed that those didn't really reflect the priority for the community, but reflected staff priority instead, which is understandable um, because staff ranked everything higher priority um, because we want to get these things done. But we figured this way was um, more strategic and showing how the strategic plan um, a project belongs to um, is showing how it fits with um, council strategic plan. 
Um, and this is just a screen grab of a uh, few of the charts in the plan. Uh, I mean, these are mostly um, easy to understand. The only one that I would draw attention to is the average department PBBI score, which is uh, per budget year. So you may see some change from year to year in this table, and that's because the programs correlating to a certain year may be more vital, higher priority in one year than in another. And then the um, uh, facilities uh, charts, I had to uh, go to a numbering system, um, and obviously when you look at the Look, uh, each number lines up with the table above it. So I pulled uh, three uh, items that I wanted to highlight. And the uh, first is this uh, police program, which uh, Captain left. Chief, uh, can you say a couple of words on this? I did not prepare him, so <laughs> that's on me. I'm, I, I guess I'm. You want me to? Ex yeah. Um, it? Yeah. If you could tell us what this is, um, you know, we uh, discussed how it will actually cut costs, and you know, why is this project? important to the police department? Uh, this this project is, is vital for us moving forward. We've come to the the end of the service life on our current system, which is WatchGuard. Uh, and we've realized that um, continuing with the current technology is not cost effective, nor is it operationally effective. Uh, we've shopped around between different uh, competitors and different uh, platforms. Axon is a leader in the industry. Uh, several local departments have also gone to Axon. Axon also provides a bundling package for in-car video, body-worn cameras, and taser programs, as well as interview rooms, which we have two of. The, one of the best features is a cloud-based storage. Uh, servers can be very expensive and have proved to be very expensive over the years. Uh, the cloud-based storage also offers uh, secure sharing of evidence between our department uh, and the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office, the City Attorney's Office, as well as uh, uh, interdepartmental. Um, there are you know, that's, that's just the operational savings. That There is some cost savings as well. WatchGuard was a little bit more expensive. Um, but operationally, this will make us more effective, and it is uh, more cost effective in the long run. They also, uh, part of the contract is they will re-up all of the hardware uh, twice throughout this five-year contract. They do it at the two-year point, and then the I'm, I'm sorry, the three-year point and then the five-year point, and then we can choose to re-up if we want. But that was the best um, package out there available. Thank you, Chief. I apologize for dropping this on you. But the reason I have it is, as the Chief said, better reliability, that leads to more transparency, and more... Um, hopefully seeing some savings on the tech side internally. Um, we, in April of 21, began to work on a facility condition assessment. And what you see in the VIP are the preliminary numbers from that assessment. Um, as I said before, unfortunately, the CIP cannot get into a ton of 
detail on each project just because it would, you know, quickly bloat into a massive document. But we will be hosting a special um, session on December 1st at 5... 5.30. 5.30 to walk through the FCA um, as a separate and more detailed document. For the purposes of this, again, these are the facts as we know them now, not a 100% uh, estimate, but you can see right um, off of this chart the large investment needed in the cooling center, which we all need, and then also quite a bit uh, that would be uh, useful in the city hall police infrastructure and the nice thing about these charts uh, is that you can see which year has uh, more ass for each uh, facility so cool again we know the next year will be a big year on needs Whereas City Hall, which is a much younger building, a lot less in the uh, near future, but necessary investments over the next five years. And then lastly, um, I wanted to highlight a capital project that has gone very well. Um, Council has already seen this information in the uh, presentation from the DPW. But what made our lead service line program successful was the proper planning and foresight to request monies to make this happen well before we were to start by the state. Um, and that is what CIP is supposed to be about, is understanding our future needs. So when it comes time to allocate, it's not a um, surprise, and you have a lot of time um, ahead to think about it and decide how best to proceed. Um, this is the same timeline, uh, just in summary tonight, if a doctor would close this portion until uh, we get to February, May, where the CIP will um, inform budget requests from city staff and that's my presentation happy to answer questions um through the chair I'll, i can kick it off with a question um i guess this is kind of a process question um so through the course of the last year especially um we as council have sort of heightened our, um, our goals and commitments um, to climate action and reducing carbon emissions. And I'm wondering how did that goal or objective factor into the discussions and the decision making uh, in, in this report and plan? Um, well, we interview each department and walk through every single their request, and as part of that, this year we had a special, uh, I mean, not even special, we had pointed questions regarding equity and uh, climate sustainability, and the question was, does this uh, impact or improve community equity, not at all, a little, or major, and then uh, similar on climate and sustainability. 
because the CIP is not a decision point, it's not really relevant to this, but when we get to budget, that information would be appropriate for council to use to prioritize. Are there other questions from council? Through the chair, I, I'm trying to understand that. Um, so, so this is a roadmap that gets us to the point of budget items, is that correct? Yeah, it's a list of possible future budget requests. Okay, so if this is a roadmap, let's say that for instance, we wanted trash cans and that under our PBBI score of 92 for public utility sanitation, we see that as a one of the highest priorities or one of our core services. At what point do we have that discussion to, to potentially allocate funding to trash cans for sanitation purposes? Um, the easiest time and, and most uh, procedural would be in uh, April during the budget writing, um, but I mean, the council has the ability to and then the budget at any time. Uh, so really it's your purview when you would raise that, but if we were going off of uh, procedure, it would be included in the April budget hearing and then uh, passed in the next year's budget. So we wouldn't be beholden to, I see that DPW is asking for fleet management every single year. Um, would that be prioritized in the budget already because of the CIP roadmap? Um, no, nothing in the CIP has priority just because. Um, the only priority that DPW fleet would have would be based on the program score and how essential each fleet item or vehicle is to a core service. And you've seen that recently with a, a dump truck request. Through the chair, I would also, for information purposes, I know he's not, he's, he's with us in the sky. Councilman Pollock is the council liaison to the CIP. Uh, so certainly working through council liaisons on capital requests is also a good place to start during the capital process. As the assistant city manager said, ultimately a budget is a city council policy and it is councils, a majority of councils purview to amend a budget and or give that input during the budget process in March and April. Through the chair, yes, Joe, but um, keep in mind, I, I'm not um, the decider of what gets discussed in the CIP and what doesn't. Um, ultimately, what ends up happening is when we have our strategic planning session, we identify what projects we want to pursue within the next year possibly two. And based on those conversations, staff then makes plans to determine what we need, what equipment, materials, um, what projects are going to take place based on those strategic plans. Um, and then they create these CIP requests. What we do, what, what uh, Christina and I do from the Planning Commission is um, we review these items with staff and staff with us rate them to determine the priority of a project solely based on how it meets our strategic plan. So you had mentioned, you know, the garbage cans and, and we've had that conversation 
but I'm not aware that the garbage cans, um, you know, uh, uh, cross cross city garbage cans was a approved strategic plan that we as a council had decided on for this year. So I, that's why I don't believe you see anything within the CIP that talks about purchasing um, a large group of garbage cans that are going to be distributed out to the community. That makes sense. Thanks, Greg. Sure. Um, are there any other questions um, in the CIP? Um, or, of course, uh, <laughs> um, I had one specifically. Um, you know, uh, there's a big ticket item in there over multiple years, and I know uh, we need to discuss about it uh, strategically with council and our fire chief, um, but we are at the end of life of a fire engine, and fire engines are very expensive. Um, so that was my question. Um, I, I guess maybe not a question, more of a comment, observation of the CIP. It's a $600,000 vehicle. We paid for it over multiple years. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk about um, why uh, fire trucks are major purchases for any city. Um, and it's over, it's $600,000, which is almost one mil um, in a millage for city revenue. So can you talk a little bit about the need of a new fire engine? Chief? <laughs> fire chief? Yeah, I would be happy to. And I understand when fire department, unfortunately our toys are expensive toys, but they're very, very critical. And I think it's important to understand the full gamut of what these vehicles provide. They do more than just put out fires. So we're talking about a new engine, essentially by standard. Um, when they get 15 years old, they should be moved to reserve status and the safety features of them updated to try to meet current safety standards as much as possible. Just like with our vehicles, there's always safety features change over 15 years. At 25 years, they're supposed to go out of service because I figure at that point, they're so out of date that um, there can be safety concerns because it's hard to retrofit them to bring them up to speed with current safety standards. Additionally, at that point in time, um, they start failing. Uh, our one engine that we have that is 25 years old when our staff goes into them in the summer, we don't have air conditioning in there. So when they're coming back from a fire, um, they're sending me pictures with a thermal imaging camera of it being 120 degrees in the cab. So they're coming from, back from fighting a fire, wearing essentially a snowmobile suit, because most people understand, sitting in kind of an oven and set on low temperature all the way back. That becomes a safety hazard. But our engines are not just about um, fighting fires. They are licensed medical response apparatus. So when anybody's having a medical emergency in our response area, they are dispatched to be first on scene to initiate life-saving medical care. They respond to every, uh, the full array of um, emergencies we can have, whether it be from medical emergencies, car accidents, hazardous materials, tech rescue, structure fires, car fires, down power lines, on and on and on. And they carry a lot of specialized equipment that can't just go into a small vehicle. They bring water to the fire. They bring a lot of specialized equipment. And there's, so they're big, um, but they also provide a wide array of services. So it, when we call them a fire engine, there's so much more than that. And here in the city of Ferndale, all of our, all of our personnel are licensed to paramedic level or get up to that level. So you have a very high level of medical expertise um, coming on that apparatus until a transporting um, ambulance can arrive. So if it, every city kind of goes through this because it is a big ticket item and it is, I know when I come to the table, I have expensive asks. Um, you can buy a lot of police cars for the price of one of my vehicles. Um, but there are, they are a specialized vehicle and that's, and we expect it, we try and we work hard to get 25 years out because we know we have to take care of that. We have to stretch it to its full um, lifespan to get the most in return for our cities. So if we can get a rotation where we can move them from frontline to reserve at the 15 years, that's gonna help us ensure we get that full 25 years out and maximize the city's investment. And that is the goal, is to get on that replacement cycle so we don't have a lot of apparatus failing at the same time 
and now we have an even much bigger ask to the city because now we're trying to replace multiple vehicles at once. The other thing to consider with ours, because they're so specialized, they take time to make. Right now, for me to order an ambulance, I'm looking at about a year to receive it. For me to order a fire truck, if we made a decision today, which I know that's not, but just for example, by the time we initiate the process, we're probably looking at it close to two years before we receive that fire engine. So again, all this stuff comes into play because we have to think about that planning of that fire engine that's already 25 years old. I understand the replacement is very expensive, but what does it potentially mean to our community if we don't work toward um, making that commitment to replace it? And what could that mean for what I have available to respond to the needs of our community? So that is my concern. And I, like I said, I understand it's a huge ask. I understand it's a lot on the community, but the return of that investment to our community is also big. Hopefully that answers your question. It does, thank you. And I know we'll have more discussion when the budget uh, comes up and we'll have to uh, make real decisions about when to proceed and how to proceed um, like that. Um, I know uh, Councilman Mikulski has more questions, but I wanted to make sure other council members, and I know Greg, you've been immersed in this. Um, so um, uh, are there any questions? this time from uh, either of you before we move on. Okay, open the floor to Councilman Mikulski, thank you. Uh, I only have two other questions, and they were about specific items on the budget. So, Withington Alley Enhancement is a strategic priority, $550,000, and that was fiscal year 2023. Could I get some more information about that? Yeah, so that is an item out of the Ferndale Mood plan, and it has uh, appeared in at least the two uh, previous years' CIP. Um, it has yet to receive any funding, but uh, like some other items in here, because it's in the uh, strategic plan, staff. Uh, does include it as an optional uh, project for council. I, I do want to, um, the uh, planning piece leading into that is part of the uh, mobility plan. Um, residents have really flagged uh, pedestrian access and safety issues with the parking lot. Uh, I asked the same question prior to the, to the meeting, like what's this? <laughs> um, so, uh, it, it gets bumped every year um, from the budget. So I think we'll just have to discuss where this fits in priority as we look at other to do items for the city. Through the chair, I'd, I'd add this is one of the benefits of updating the plan on an annual basis every August. Uh, because there are plans, there's a lot of projects like this that might be an operational or strategic priority, but when we balance priorities, we don't necessarily have the funding to advance it. This way it, it keeps it on the radar as a strategic item and we can shift the funding on an annual basis, right? So next fall, again, we can explore whether this is a fundable priority or not, or well, that will actually be tested in the budget process first, but then if it's not funded in the budget process, it's just amended in the annual CIP process in the fall, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, yeah, we never forget projects and priorities. Yeah, and uh, similar to the fire engine, the fire engine has been in the CAP, uh, I think, slated for 25 for the last two years, but upon, uh, you know, uh, very gratefully having a new chief who is excellent, she has identified that, no, we need to act on this or figure something else out. And so that allocation changed from 25, a one-time big purchase to 23 spread out over five years. Which is uh, easier to manage <laughs> financially. And through the chair, I have one more question. Sure, go ahead. The, the last item that came up in the conversation was a rain barrel replacement program to the city manager's office. And I was hoping you could give me a little bit more information on that. 
Yeah, so that is a CIP that is also a American Wrestling Plan Act uh, submission. And so we have uh, quite a few of these CIPs that will appear in the ARPA recommendations. That was one that uh, I will hand over to City Manager Rasho, although I do believe it was uh, Claire Dion who submitted it. Uh, through the chair, yes. This is actually uh, a good reminder that since our sustainability planner left in August, we've shifted Claire Dion, our zero waste coordinator, under the city manager's office. And it's a great example of how Claire is still making sure that sustainability as a policy is very much at the forefront of our thoughts strategically. So she does have the purview to submit projects on our behalf. This is one of the projects she wanted to submit on behalf of the city manager's office. And it did coincide with a second project that I submitted uh, requesting some use of ARPA funding to support private uh, home investment to mitigate flood damage. So I think uh, Claire's proposal coupled with, with our proposal together will hopefully uh, result in a positive stormwater mitigation proposal for ARPA funds from the city manager's office. And as the title suggests, it's a uh, city rebate on uh, the purchase and installation of the main barrel uh, set up. Great, thank you. Through the chair, I've got one last question to bring us home. Sure. Right with that. Um, one, apologies to folks who are hanging out for the street cafes. We'll get there in a second, I swear. <laughs> but two, um, sort of going back to my, my process um, questions. Um, so one, I understand that this, um, we are required under law to, um, to have a capital improvement plan. Um, I'm gonna call myself out a little bit and say I, I struggled to remember doing this last year. It's been a long year. Um, but it, it, it sort of tells me that um, I don't recall sort of coming back to this plan or referring to it throughout the last year. So can, can you um, either talk about how it is um, referred to or used internally or, or make some recommendations on how to, I don't know, breathe more life into it this coming year? Yeah, so the internally we use it all the time because it's our reference point uh, between the city manager's office, finance, and uh, department as far as uh, planning and budgeting a uh, timeline on an item. But the best answer for council is in your agenda items on the cover page, every item has a, uh, a line that says CIP. And if it appeared in a plan, that number will be listed, which enables you to go back and pull that uh, plan, look at how it was originally uh, you know, brought to council and then uh, go from there. Great, thank you. All right, um, really great questions. Um, I think uh, really great work um, by staff, but we need a motion to proceed. What is the pleasure of council? Mayor, I move that we adopt the 2023 to 2027 capital improvement plan as recommended by the Planning Commission and as submitted by the Assistant City Manager. Second. Uh, moved by Mayor Pro Tem Leaks May and seconded by Councilwoman James. Uh, Madam Clerk. Sorry, Mayor. If uh, through the chair. Oh, go ahead, Councilman Polica. So I just want, before we take the vote, I just wanted to, to um, thank 
um, all the uh, people who participated in the CIP process, um, all the department heads, um, uh, Christine from, uh, from Planning Commission. Uh, it's a, a long day uh, that we review all of these. There's dozens and dozens that we review individually. We talk to each department head about you know, the importance of it. Um, you know, what are the details, what are their, you know, expectations, um, and, and it's, like I said, it's just a lot of work, so I just want to thank everybody involved, and, and especially Kyle for putting everything together and keeping us on target and on track and keeping everything organized, so thank you, Mayor, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Mayor. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk, we have a motion on the floor. Councilmember Mikulski? Yes. Councilmember Pollica? Yes. Councilmember James? Yes. Mayor Pertem Leakes May? Yes. And Mayor Piana? Yes. And that item passes unanimously. Uh, thank you to everyone. And moving on to the feature of the evening, 8B, consideration of resolutions related to continue policies for temporary outdoor seating, dining, and sales. And introducing this item is our DDA director, Lena Stevens. Thank you, Lena, for being here. Oh, thank you. Okay. I'm guessing. Give me just a moment here, I'm so sorry. And are you pulling up a presentation? I am, okay. yeah, and I have to go back to the Zoom thingy and <laughs> I think I'm doing it. Have I done that right, Kyle? I think maybe it's possible I haven't. Uh, you had to open your presentation All right, I think that should do it. There we go. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Lena Stevens. I'm the Ferndale DDA Director. I'm bringing forward four resolutions for your consideration tonight related to outdoor seating and dining. Uh, these resolutions would be in effect for various lengths of time, basically depending on need and relevance and also staff time needed to bring forward more permanent uh, recommendations. So what are you being asked to approve tonight? The first, uh, sidewalk cafes. This would essentially allow winter sidewalk cafes. This was something we did last year, but we have to remember that was pre-vaccine. Behaviors were different. Uh, business priorities were different. So I think this is a, will be an interesting year. Uh, the resolution would allow sidewalk cafes to remain in place until March 1st, 2022. That is when they would be responsible for obtaining their permit for the next cycle, so that that would come in the spring. Uh, the next two resolutions would be in effect through March 31st of 2022. Uh, the first would uh, continue the existing policy of allowing adjacent businesses to lease parking spaces for patios. Um, we're going to get into a little more detail. I have some pictures of these if, if, you're, if uh, you need some clarity on what these mean. Um, and also we would uh, continue our moratorium on uh, the food truck and vending restrictions in downtown. Uh, that's been a policy that's been in effect for 18 months. Essentially what, we, what we're doing here is giving ourselves some time to continue existing policy while we work on uh, permanent recommendations in both of these categories. The last resolution relates to temporary accessory buildings. So these would be tents, igloos, greenhouses, things that you we started to see a little bit pre-pandemic and now we're, we're seeing a lot more of them. Um, and this relates to the Central Business District and any other commercially zoned district. So if you think of Detroit Fleet, which is not in the Central Business District, this would still apply to them and all the permit requirements would apply. Um, this would allow these structures for the maximum of 180 days on each property between December 1 and November 30th. Um, so why are you being asked to consider these resolutions? Uh, the first is the continuation of existing policy. It's important for businesses, for anybody really, to know um, what they can expect from us with a, an appropriate amount of time. The current resolutions expire uh, in, on November 30th, 2021. So this continues those policies. 
Uh, the second is that, um, as you heard from some of our businesses, pandemic recovery support is still necessary. Um, there's fluctuations in the labor market, fluctuations in consumer confidence that are uh, in, in having an effect on spending and behaviors, um, and then customer demands for space when they are coming out in person uh, to, to a restaurant specifically in that case. Um, and finally, uh, we want to continue the creative use of space and exploring um, how we can use spaces that may have been previously really looked at as only for a vehicle, and now we're seeing how we can use them for people. Um, I, again, you know, knowing that some of these policies were in place last winter um, under different circumstances, now with you know higher vaccination rates and things like that, I think we'll have a lot of opportunities for um, observation. Uh, and we can look at which of these policies we want to continue long-term and which we maybe want to uh, think and let go of, if I borrow Marie Kondo language. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm going to get into each one individually. They're not going to take a whole lot of time, and please feel free to stop me at any point if, if something isn't clear. Uh, this is definitely the kind of thing that seems a little bit more simple, and then as you get into it, <laughs> there's nuance to it, so don't hesitate to, to jump in. So again, the sidewalk cafes, this resolution would be in effect until March 1, 2022, when they are required to obtain a new permit. In the, inside the central business district, they will be required to have five feet of unobstructed right of way, whereas outside or in all other zoning districts, they will uh, be able to do it with four feet. The reason for that is that this is the second winter in which the DDA is contracting with the Department of Public Works for snow clearance of a pedestrian path in the downtown area. I want to be very clear, this is not snow removal from building to curb, but the goal is to make downtown more accessible in a cost-effective uh, way that respects the demands on the time of DPW, especially during snow events. Uh, it's the second year we're trying it, and so that recommendation uh, relates to that, uh, that service. Um, secondarily, I wanted to note that if a licensee is responsible for a civil infraction for snow removal, meaning that they don't remove their snow or they do it improperly, that this could be revoked. So if we say, yes, you can have your winter cafe, but you don't shovel your snow, we can say, no, I'm sorry, you can no longer have your winter cafe. So that's that one. And I will move on unless there are any questions. Okay, so temporary use of parking. So right now, where can you see this? You can see it at the Valentine Distilling Company, and you can see it uh, in, at One-Eyed Betty's in the parking lots that's the east of the business. Um, so there are leases available daily, weekly, and monthly, and they are paying for these. So that's, I think that's important to note. I think a few people weren't sure on that. There is actual, you know, there are fees associated with it. What, what I'm asking tonight is that we continue this policy through March 31st that allows Essentially, Valentine's and 1A Buddies to keep those patios racking for the winter. Uh, and uh, if somebody else were to want to lease a, a parking space, we would do so telling them, don't put anything in that space that you're not willing to let go of on March 31st, you know, so that they're aware. Now, the intent would be that we have a more permanent ordinance um, uh, for recommendation for an annual process. Because so far, actually, I should have mentioned this before, I have received no complaints on any of these options, nor to my knowledge has the city of Ferndale. Now that doesn't mean that questions wouldn't start to pop up in the future as we look to recovery and things change. And I think we're gonna talk about that in the temporary buildings piece. I think it's gonna be more applicable. But this is something I do think we should look at every year, but we probably need a process to make sure we're not overdoing it, uh, to make sure that maybe there's not too many in any one given quadrant or area of the city if we know we're having pinched parking requirements in a certain area. So uh, the goal would be to have something come in front of the Ordinance Review Committee and be in place before this sunset date. So I'm sort of setting a clock for myself here. Uh, mobile sales and vending, this is the one I expect to be least utilized. It's just really continuing our existing policy. Uh, so let's say we get a nice warm day if Imperial wanted to put their taco truck over at the pop-up park, we would have the ability to permit that and allow it. Again, this is through December 31st, so if we don't change anything by that point, we would revert back to the highly restrictive 2012 uh, resolutions, which are very, very 
particular about where those food trucks can be and under what hours they could be there. Same thing with uh, Shioni Designs. She's done a little pop-up purple tent from time to time in the pedestrian alley between uh, West Troy and West Nine Mile. Surprisingly enough, that's actually the location that is allowed <laughs> uh, by the 2012 ordinance, but uh, the times, the hours are, are uh, what we've been flexible with in that location. So um, again, with the winter, I really don't expect to see this, but in talking with uh, the city attorney, you know, we felt that it'd be better to have an option for this rather than not since we have been allowing it for the past 18 months. Okay, and the last one, uh, drum roll please, a temporary accessory building. So again, tents, igloos, greenhouses, things that are temporary. Um, these structures under this resolution, these structures could be in place for a maximum of six months or 180 days in the 12 month period from December 1 of this year to November 30th of next year. Um, this essentially represents a balance of flexibility for the businesses with the city's responsibility to protect public safety. So fire code defines a temporary structure very specifically as 180 days out of any 12, uh, 12 month period on a particular property. When you go beyond that, there's specific rules. So, uh, you know, fire suppression is a really good that if you're going to have a structure that's in place for many years, you're going to have fire suppression. So when we have these tents in place that are permitted and managed as temporary, but they're functioning as semi-permanent, you know, we were worried that they were sort of skirting the line. So we wanted to see how we could balance that with, um, again, going back to business support during the pandemic recovery. So this represents the balance that was struck. Uh, dedicating this 12 month period, allowing them to have the six months of their choosing. If they have an existing permit, so let's look at where we have existing tents uh, as, I can't see my own presentation, Otis Supply, Bobcat Bonnie's, Valentine Distilling, I missed on here Elks and Ferndale Project. They also have temporary tents in place. So those uh, permittees will be uh, receiving a letter saying that they need to give us one, a letter from an engineer that's uh, attesting to the structural integrity of the structure. So that's first. The second thing is that they will be inspected as though they were new. So the same way they were inspected when they were put up, they're gonna be inspected again. That means they're gonna have occupancy looked at. They're gonna be looking at, do you have fire extinguishers? What are your methods of egress? Do you have enough spacing for people to get out? Things like that. So they're gonna go through that same process. If a new tent is going up, they're going to follow all of those same procedures. So they're gonna have the same inspections and they will be subject to that same 180 days rule. So the clock basically starts on December 1 for everybody. I think the third step that we'll talk about for long-term is allowing the small structures on an annual basis in a more permanent uh, methodology. You'll see in a little bit here, uh, I think if I bring forth any more resolutions on this, uh, Dan is going to have my head, so we are moving to more permanent, uh, permanent ordinance changes in the future. However, I don't expect those recommendations, uh, unless I hear otherwise from y'all, to continue uh, to allow the tents. Those are not allowed by zoning, so we also have to do relax zoning restrictions to allow those. While we haven't received any complaints, I think we've been more than flexible in allowing these tent structures. I think 180 days out of the next uh, 12 months is generous. It gives them a long her, you know, time horizon to plan for how they want to be accommodating their customers in the future. Uh, oh, yep, uh, there we go. Actually, that just, that just uh, summarizes what I just went through there about uh, what they'll be required to do. Um, and as I mentioned, these are the current fees that are in place. So food trucks are 275 for review, tents, like we just talked about, temporary structures, 275 Push carts, 88 walk-up windows, $50. Those have been uh, used in a couple of places as well. And then we also have the parking space leases. Uh, I also want to note here that these were discounted significantly uh, for the, the leases of the parking spaces, again, as a, as a COVID response. So we are going to be looking at what would be a more accurate representation of the 
foregone revenue to the parking system by leasing out these parking spaces for patios. So that would be part of our more permanent recommendation um, for an annual process here. Um, so <laughs> what to expect next? As I said, no more resolutions, promise. Um, an annual leasing application for parking spaces, annual licenses for small temporary structures, and again, probably working to define what that means, and potentially some more permissive vending regulations for downtown. Um, I haven't done extensive conversations on this, but I do know from a few of the conversations we've had, I think some of the uh, perspectives on food trucks may have shifted a little in recent years, and I think we could look at how we might be able to balance them in the downtown and accommodate them for, uh, you know, for the purposes that they serve while not necessarily overshadowing our, our brick and mortars. And with that, I am done and I am here for any questions. Thank you for the uh, awesome. comprehensive uh, <laughs> overview of uh, the multiple resolutions we're being asked to <laughs> approve tonight. But I'm going to open up um, uh, questions to council for uh, Lena at this time. Any questions? Mr. The chair, I, I guess I can start. Um, just a few questions that came up while you were going through the slides. So in terms of the, the unobstructed space around the sidewalk cafes, does that remain unchanged, the five feet for uh, the CBD area and four feet elsewhere within the city? Um, no, that does not remain unchanged. Um, sorry for the double negative there. It, in, right now it is four feet for all sidewalk cafes. That is what is allowed. In per so the five feet is actually a is is a deviation from that and so that's why it was set specifically in the central business district for the snow removal okay and do we know if any of the businesses had any civil infractions um regarding snow removal oh <laughs> i do not that's a very good question and i can find out and two last questions so if if a business, and I'm just thinking of Bobcat Bonnie's as an example, that has the, the sort of rigid structure around their patio in the back, mm -hmm. would that business need to, need to move their patio walls closer to the building um, due to this five foot unobstructed area around their, their sidewalk cafe? Or, or does the sidewalk itself as the unobstructed path. So I think that the difference there is, for Bobcat Bonnie specifically, their back patio is on their private property, not on the, the sidewalk. So when we're talking about a sidewalk cafe, we're thinking about more um, like Pops for Italian, or think, like, think about what fronts Nine Mile, essentially, or what fronts Woodward, things like that. So that's really what we're talking about when it comes to a sidewalk cafe license. When, when you're talking about the... Um, the tents. Now there still might be some some rules and, and things like that. So that will come up when they get their inspection through the fire and the building department. So if there is a code that says this tent needs to be X number of feet from the building, certainly they will work through that with the with the business owner. But it won't relate to the sidewalk sidewalk cafe uh, clearances. Okay. So to piggyback on that, do we know which businesses may be impacted or how many businesses may be? in needing to move their sidewalk cafe boundaries back? Um, I don't. What I do know is that the two businesses who reached out specifically to request this were New Way Bar and Tony Sports Bar. Uh, they did not, they would not have met the five foot clearance. And so I don't think moving back their patio would have been something they would consider because really what all their probably trying to do is capture maybe those few nice days that we're going to have in December um, and where people might be willing to go out and be outside. I don't, my instinct is that there's not many businesses who would say, oh, I don't meet the five foot clearance, so I'm going to move my patio back for the off chance that we get some nice weather. But to answer your question, no, I do not have a count of how many in the downtown would not meet the five foot clearance. Yeah, if they want to leave it up, we would have to talk through that with them and get out there and measure it. Okay, final question, I promise. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. Temporary structures, 
and those structures being up for only six months. So has there been any change in terms of requirements for those structures besides just the, the recertification? The only change would be if they have been up already for a period of time, they will be required to have a letter from, a, from an engineer attesting to their structural integrity, their continued structural integrity. So that would be the only change in existing policy. Other than that, everything else has been, uh, has been a part of our process when we inspected them. All right, there's one more question. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. It's all occurring to me now. Um, so in terms of getting a structural engineer to certify like a tent or a greenhouse, have you, have you experienced that before? Is that, is that something that structural engineers typically look at? I'm just not sure what that process looks like for a potential restaurant or bar to go through that and ask for an engineer to certify a tent. That is a good point. No, we have not gone through this before. We felt it was a reasonable, uh, a reasonable approach. Uh, for example, when I took down like a, a partial wall in my house, I had a structural engineer, paid him $500. He said, yep, I don't think it's load bearing. You can go ahead and take it down. And I submitted that letter to the city of Ferndale for my permit. Um, we have not gone through that for a tent. It is our best approach, um, and and I, I suspect it's not going to have problems. But if it does, we would I would continue to work that through with the building official and the fire marshal. But right now, we have every reason to expect it'll it'll be a functional methodology. But we've never done it before. <laughs> yeah. Good question, Councilwoman. Um, any other questions from council? Um, uh, with that, we need a, a motion to proceed. Who's going to tackle that one? <laughs> okay, so um, I, I approve resolutions extending the current relaxation of zoning regulations related to temporary outdoor seating, sales, and accessory structures as outlined in the attached resolution and as submitted by the DDA director. We'll uh, second that motion if it's deemed adequate by our council. Uh, through the chair, I, I do find that uh, adequate, uh, assuming that there's consensus. Obviously, council could split the question should it should it need to be. Absent that, uh, it's acceptable. Okay, so moved by Councilman Pollock, seconded by uh, Councilwoman Jane. Um, further discussion or comments by council? Through um, the chair. Oh, oh. Go ahead, uh, so, Thank you. Um, so I think this is great. Um, I know I've talked to a number of business owners that really love having the flexibility of doing this, especially in the off season. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that we could make this um, you know, some of these temporary options uh, a little more permanent in the future. Um, through the chair, uh, I, uh, I second Councilman Pollock's remarks. This to me is um, as pretty close to a no brainer as it gets. Um, I have really enjoyed being able to utilize some of these spaces um, you know, last year, um, when this came before us, um, it was all sort of speculative, you know, assuming that businesses would want to take advantage of it. I have some memory of, um, of sort of saying to ourselves that, well, we'll try it and we'll find out how it goes. We'll make some, uh, tweaks to see if we can, um, improve it moving forward. I think that's where we are now um, and what i would ask of of residents is that as we have an eye toward making some of these changes permanent now is the time to sort of reach out and give us some feedback if there are some you know continued improvements that need to be made and some adjustments um, i'd really like to hear from residents and hear about those concerns over the next couple of months because i think there's 
um, you know, one good reason to support these resolutions as presented tonight, and two, um, you know, good reason to move forward with making some some permanent um, options available. Um, well, you all said what I was going to say, <laughs> uh, so I concur too. I think, you know, out of out of the pandemic. Um, the adaptation that we've all had to do and their business has had to do, I think this is um, a really great lesson when you provide some flexibility. Um, businesses um, are giving more opportunity to businesses to, to thrive. And I think as um, our COVID numbers are predicted to go up in November and December, um, I think this is, uh, we're still in the recovery and this is the most appropriate action to take forward and uh, look with, work with our DDA, our city, and our business owners what can go permanent um, in the future because it's not that far to March 2022. Um, so I have a feeling we'll be having this uh, conversation again in four or five months, if not sooner, um, and talking about what, what is permanent and what um, needs to be more temporary on a seasonal basis. So, uh, I yeah, through the chair. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like to not only uh, hear, hear from the residents, but Lena, is there some sort of a protocol as to how uh, the businesses uh, are, are responding uh, to this flexibility? Because I'd like to know how, how they feel about it as well um, in the months yep. coming forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think engagement has to be a piece of this. I think I should... <laughs> I think I should acknowledge that that is hard right now. Um, getting business feedback specifically is difficult and it's one of the things we're kind of working on with our University of Michigan project team. We're actually working at this point, I'm getting down to texting, where we would text and say, here, vote on this or this. Do you like this? Do you not like that? And we're hoping that maybe that's a way that we can start to get some engagement because things that worked pre or during the you know peak of the of the pandemic aren't working as well now when these folks are really really exhausted and inundated with email and things like that so we're working on it um and i think door to door is also just gonna have to be a piece of that but yeah it wouldn't be in my intent to necessarily bring this back to you without um at least a a reliable amount of engagement All right, we've got an approved motion on the floor. Uh, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Pollica? Yes. Councilmember Jane? Yes. Mayor Pertem Leek Smay? Yes. Councilmember Mikulski? Yes. And Mayor Piana? Yes, and that is approved uh, unanimously. Um, go forth businesses and serve our community <laughs> through the winter. Okay, uh, next up, we're moving on to call the council. And because um, that concludes our regular agenda items, moving on to call to council, starting with um, our city manager and our department directors giving updates what's going on in their world. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this evening, we will lead off with our Parks and Recreation Department. Emmanuel, if you are promoted, can you please give us an update? Ah, good evening, Mayor Council. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. All right, just wanted to give, to give a quick uh, update from our department. We are hosting our Santa Parade. It'll be taking place on Saturday, December 4th from 1 to 4 p.m. More details about the planned routes and the planned activities will be posted in the coming weeks. Uh, we're putting that on in conjunction with our uh, DDA, so we want to give a shout out to them. Uh, and we are also planning a handful of winter basketball clinics. Because of uh, our situation with the pandemic, and our ability to host things indoors. Uh, we've been unable to host our regular basketball leagues that we usually do with our Little Eagles program. So this is meant to supplement uh, what would usually be our, our basketball league. Those will be taking place in January or February. Uh, registration is available now. We have a beginner's uh, clinic that'll be for seven to nine year olds and a uh, regular clinic that'll be given to nine through 12 year olds. So again, information on that is on our website and on our registration site. If anybody has any questions, uh, just give us a call. Thank you, Emmanuel. Next is City Clerk Bernie McGrath. 
So I just wanted to give an update on election day. So it went really well, um, no major problems out there. Um, we had a turnout of 2,694 voters out of 16,606 active registered voters. So that's a turnout of about 16.22%. Um, what's notable though, is that that's an increase of about 175% over the 2017, which was the last comparable election, which was the last one with only incumbents on the ballot. Um, so th this time we had uh, 1,988 AV ballots and uh, pre-pandemic, that would be an absolutely killer turnout for a presidential election in our AV. So it's really interesting how um, the community has really decided to stick with absentee voting after the 2020 election. Um, this time we had 73% who voted AV and 27% with uh, precinct voters, which is almost exactly the same as we had in November of 2020. So it seems like the shift to AV voting is here to stay. Um, so with that, I wanna thank my elections team. Um, so that's election manager, Jordan Smelly, and our season election staff of Jenna Nelson and Randy Horn, who I like to refer to as the best darn election team in the universe for their hard work in preparing for election day and managing the um, daily audits of our AVs to make sure all the ballots were sufficiently counted. Um, I also wanna thank uh, Deputy Clerk Kira Khan for holding down the rest of the fort, um, doing everything else while we were um, preoccupied with the daily election audits. And also want to thank my um, precinct inspectors for their work on election day. And of course, as always, the city hall staff for their patience and support during the election season. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Uh, next, Lena, if you could come back up and give us just a little update on BDA's festivities. Yes, I asked to be able to share a new website with you that we are really proud of. So, oh, oh gosh, I hate this little thing. Here we go. Okay, so this is frostyferndale.com. This is your new source for everything festive in, uh, in downtown Ferndale this holiday season. So um, <laughs> don't be a cotton-headed ninny buggins and shop small in downtown Ferndale. So um, this is the site. You're going to be able to find uh, gifts, self-care, fitness, and well-being. So you can find things that you want to buy or experiences that you want to give to your friends and loved ones who've had a really hard 18 months. Uh, you don't feel like cooking, order some takeout. Our Ferndale Dollars e-gift card program is back and we will be offering holiday bonus bucks with our sponsors, uh, Giffels Webster and Versa Real Estate. Uh, so if you remember from last year, you could buy a gift card and get a little bonus card that you had to spend in a certain amount of time. So we're bringing that back uh, at a date to be decided. Basically when the money hits the bank account, we'll let you know. Uh, there's events, so if you click over here on events and go down, you're going to see some really fun things that are happening. So first is Deck the Downtown. That's going to start on Friday, or I'm sorry, on Wednesday. You're going to be able to pick up a free ornament from five locations, return it back to AR Workshop by the 21st for a chance to have your ornament hung on our downtown tree or other trees around downtown. We did it last year with, I believe, about 300 ornaments in partnership with Parks and Rec. We have a thousand this year, so really hoping you'll see some uh, cute self-decorated ornaments around downtown. Um, we're also gonna be having a Small Business Saturday again. You're gonna see us out over at the dot. We're also gonna be the home base for the Ferndalian Quest if you wanna be questing around to find uh, Gordy, I think his name is. Gordy, the little Ferndalian alien looking guy. He's super cute. Um, and at that same day, you're also going to see the tree lighting. So most of you should have it on your calendar. This is a public event. You're going to see a Facebook event go live this week. Um, right there at the intersection of Allen and West Troy, we're going to be lighting our live tree that will be uh, planted in a park. Why are you giggling at me, Kara? We're going to be uh, <laughs> planting it in a park. We're going to have live music right now. We're thinking about a Latin band, so it's going to be a little bit different. Just add a little bit of spice into our tree lighting. We're going to have giveaways and hopefully some hot cocoa from Java Hut. We're really excited about that. So, And then we'll be excited to welcome Santa into downtown again in collaboration with Parks and Rec. So I just really wanted you to see this site. Uh, we've been working on it 
for a little bit. It's going to be combined with some uh, print ads and Facebook ads and things like that. So hopefully by the end of the season, you're never going to want to hear the term Frosty Ferndale ever again because you're going to see it so darn much. So I uh, just wanted to share that with you and, and uh, just thank you and hope everybody comes on down and, you know, has a little bit of holiday spirit in Ferndale this year. Thank you. You're welcome. It's a very cute Ooh. site. Thank you, Lena. Uh, also uh, supported by DPW, and that's a nice segue for me to Dan Antosic to give us a little update on DPW services. Yeah, good evening tonight, Mayor and Council. So just a quick update um, with the holiday this week. There will be no interruption in waste and recycling collection, um, but that will occur the week of Thanksgiving. So those that have their pickup on Thursday, the day of Thanksgiving, um, and the Friday after, you will you will be pushed today. So Thursday's pickup will be on Friday. Friday's pickup will be on Saturday. Um, and as many residents may know, we are out in the community right now working through our curbside week pickup. So if you do have questions or concerns um, when that schedule is going to be, please visit the DBW's website, city's Facebook page, or give us a call and we can let you know when your pickup will be. And thanks, have a nice night, everyone. Um, I had one question before you went forward. I'm getting a lot of questions from residents concerned that their leaves are not falling uh, to match the leaf pickup schedule. Um, can you talk about how flexible the DPW is and uh, that you guys might flex to, to, to accommodate it feeling like summer today and the leaves are not falling? Yes, we do um, have the option, if need be, to extend um, curbside leaf collection additionally. Um, in addition to that, um, residents will have the option to bag their leaves up until I believe it is the week of, one moment, um, the week of December 13th too. Um, so we can have the ability to adjust our schedule a bit um, based on how the leaves fall. Okay, it's on people's minds because they, they see their leaves are not falling. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. We'll do what we can to let those stress levels fall. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> couldn't resist. Um, all right, next is uh, Fire Chief Therese Robinson. All right, good evening, Council and everybody. So I have two updates tonight. Um, the first one is after an awesome meeting and lunch with um, the city manager and his staff, and we were talking about the composting program that launched in Ferndale, we started thinking about, you know, my work environment is like your home. You know, my staff live where they work, and we're there for 24 hours, and they shop, cook, eat. So we produce a lot of the same waste we do in our homes. So the fire department has opted to launch and become part of the composting program. We will be launching it this week, and we're hoping to really inspire people and lead by example. And we truly do want to embrace and be part of the city's vision for climate resiliency and a lot of things. So on Wednesday the 10th, that's Wednesday, right? The curbside containers will be de delivered to the station. Claire will be bringing over all the stuff and we'll be educating our personnel and we will actually be starting to compost all of our food waste and paper towels that we have at our stations to try to minimize the impact where our fire stations are having as much as possible. So very excited about that. My personnel are excited about that. When we talked about it, they were like, yeah, let's do this. So I think it's great to try to, you know, for us lead by example in other ways, even outside of our normal scope. So it's, we're excited to be a part of that. Um, the other thing I want to bring up, and I know I've talked about it before, is open burning. Um, I am a citizen of Ferndale. I do live here. I walk the streets. And I see people enjoying those wonderful backyard, you know, campfires, which is a beautiful, wonderful thing. But we want to make sure people remember that you have to get an open burn permit, and it's good for a calendar year. I know there's been some changes and some um, misunderstandings that if you got one 10 years ago, it's still good. It's not. Um, so every January, you need to get one for the season. 
And the reason is we want to ensure everybody can do it safe. We want that fun backyard activity to stay fun and wonderful and not turn into a tragedy. So just remind everybody, please, please, please um, apply for your burn permit. It's $25 a year. And don't be burning things. Your leaves, put them out to the street. Don't put them in your fire pit. Don't be burning garbage, all those things, because that does create additional hazard, um, a lot of issues. So um, contact us at the fire department if you have any questions, but just please try to be compliant with city ordinance and let us all be safe and enjoy those activities in a fun way. Thank you, Chief, and I'll go ahead and take us home. I wanna thank you, Chief, for hosting us. They, uh, they actually were kind enough to make the city manager's office lunch and so we got to have lunch with the uh, with the crew down at the station and it's an initiative uh, I think everyone understands we've had significant staffing changes so we find it to be an imperative for the city manager's office to engage with every department with where they're at and so uh, with Denicia and Claire moving over to the city manager's office Kyle and I thought it was a great opportunity to re-engage every department and reintroduce ourselves to a lot of our new teams so We'll be rotating monthlies, uh, lunches with, with every department. We began with the fire department, so uh, we'll spin the wheel of fortune and, and tell you who's next. And uh, please don't feel obligated to host us for lunch, though uh, the bar is set high with the, by the fire department. So, <laughs> uh, Next, as, as uh, DPW Director Antasic Acknowledged City Hall does observe Veterans Day, so City Hall will be closed to observe Veterans Day this Thursday. Um, I want to acknowledge the CIP work that was done. It is a long process. It's an extensive process led by the Assistant City Manager. Uh, Kyle did note that he came in improving uh, the process, which is an improvement on his predecessor. That was me. So um, thank you, Kyle. You did a great job of improving on my failures. He's made it better. Uh, it's, it's an incredible process and it's a lot of work and I can't think of another person who does analysis better than Kyle. So thank you for continuously improving it. Uh, update that there is retail construction. You might have noticed that at the dot and right now there is no access at the lower level to accommodate retail construction. This is just a general public update. We'll be working in tandem with Versa on the construction of the retail spaces. They've been in very proactive communications with us. And Bruce Campbell from Republic Parking is down there now, so he's available uh, down there on the daily monitoring progress. And so if you have questions or concerns about parking, please do um, visit Bruce over at the parking office located at, near the entrance of the dot. He will be there. He or his staff could accommodate any questions. And that is, uh, that concludes my updates. Um, and now we'll move on to city council. And uh, I never remember from council meeting to council meeting who I start with. I don't keep track. But we're going to start with uh, uh, Councilman Polica from the, the voice of beyond. <laughs> yes, Mayor. <laughs> I actually have nothing this week. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we'll go to Councilman Mikulski. I have nothing additional this week. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem Leaks May. All right. I have a couple things this week. So let me get started. <laughs> First, I would like to, one, congratulate all the members of council who were re-elected. I mean, I'm very proud that uh, you all are able to retain your seats, and I'm proud to continue the good work with you. Congratulations to you all. And I hope you heard that, Councilman Pollocka. You're included in there, too. Um, thank you. I also want to thank, uh, I also want to congratulate the Ferndale Golden Eagle Marching Band for their 2021 championship win. Uh, just a little bit of a history. This win is the 10th championship for Ferndale High School Marching Band uh, since uh, the champions started in 1981, and we are one of five bands uh, in the state that have had uh, 10 championships. So kudos to them. They did a great job. I want to also thank the Ferndale Police Department for hosting, uh, for escorting the Ferndale Marching Band because you brought them back into the city like the champs that they are. So thank you so much for always being flexible and doing that. Uh, I also, we had a resolution on uh, the consent agenda tonight uh, recognizing uh, November as Native American Heritage Month. And Mayor, I'd like to read that re resolution. Uh, at, the regular, uh, at the regular meeting of City Council held November 8th, 2021 in Council Chambers, 
at City Hall uh, on, the tradition of, on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe Potawatomi and Peoria peoples, the following resolution was moved and seconded. From November 1 through the 30th, 2021, the United States celebrates the Native National Native American Heritage Month, which is an opportunity to consider and recognize the significant contributions of Native Americans to the history of the United States. And the ancestors of today, Native Amer Americans, are the original indigenous inhabitants of what is now the United States. And Michigan is the home to 12 federally recognized tribal nations who are sovereign nations with their own governments and laws. And for over 200 years, Native Americans have served with honor and distinction in the United States Armed Forces and continue to serve in greater numbers per capita than any other group and Native Americans maintain vibrant cultures and traditions and hold a deeply rooted sense of community. And despite systemic efforts by residential Indian schools to destroy Native cultures through forced assimilation, indigenous cultures and languages have survived. And Native Americans have, moved, have moving stories of tragedy, triumph, and perseverance that need to be shared with future generations. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Ferndale City Council recognizes the month of November 2021 as Native National Native American Heritage Month, recognizes the Friday after Thanksgiving as Native American Heritage Day in accordance with the, Nas the Native American Heritage Day Act of 2009, and urges the residents of Ferndale to observe National Native, Native Her American Heritage Month and Native American Heritage Day with appropriate programs and activities. That's it for me tonight, Mayor. Thank you. And going on, uh, moving on to uh, Councilwoman Dean. Um, just very briefly, uh, in addition to Ferndale um, election results last week, I wanted to let folks know that the city of Ann Arbor um, approved uh, the use of ranked choice voting in their municipal elections, following in the footsteps of Ferndale uh, back in 2004. Um, so I think that that step forward um, is good news for us that we will have another partner city to work with in um, sort of working with the state to uh, work break through some of these barriers that we've had toward implementation. In your next municipal elections, you will be able to rank your choices, we hope. All right, thank you. Um, and then finally, I wanted to extend my uh, congratulations to Councilman Pollica and Councilman Mikulski on uh, your election wins. And um, I know it wasn't a highly contentious race um, in Ferndale. I just appreciate that we're moving forward and we'll be able to work together on uh, priorities because I think some of our hardest work is ahead of us uh, as we deal with um, facility issues and another range of uh, topics um, coming ahead in the next 12 months. I also want to remind folks that um, we sort of brought it up tonight with the resolution on extending outdoor um, cafes, but the pandemic is still underway and they're predicting an increase in cases in November and December as we head back indoors. Uh, there are 174 cases of COVID in our zip code, which is really high compared to where we were three months ago. So uh, we are still not out of the woods yet. And I know everybody is pretty tired of um, the, the pandemic, um, but we are still navigating through it. So I encourage folks to get vaccinations and vaccination for kids so that we can begin to uh, not wear masks and uh, have our businesses go back to normal. I tried to go to a coffee shop today and they're still not letting people inside. Fortunately, it was great outside and I, I sat outside, but um, you know, I might not want to do that in December. So um, things are still not back to normal. And um, so still proceed with caution and care and compassion with others. And then finally, um, you know, it may not be really exciting for all of you, but it's really exciting for me, but the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act passed. Um, I've been on the National League of Cities Infrastructure and uh, 
Transportation and Infrastructure Committee for over three years. And I have to say prior to 2021, it was really hard to get anything done in Infrastructure Week. Um, I even participated in Infrastructure Week in DC and it became a running joke that nothing was ever going to pass, ever. Um, and so to have it pass and be a part of advocacy through the National League of Cities on behalf of Michigan and of Ferndale, um, I'm really excited because there's a couple things in the bill that um, uh, are really going to hopefully be transformational for cities. And one of them, um, Pop, is a Safe Streets for All program and that the federal government is actually taking on a complete streets um, project and policy that supports safe and comfortable, convenient and independent movement of all users. You wouldn't believe uh, that wasn't part of their program. Um, and so put cities in opposition of state DOTs as well as federal DO, uh, the Department of Transportation at the federal level. There's $5 billion going into supporting local government do vision zero plans um, to reduce crashes and fatalities, especially for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, lots of money for bridge repair. Um, there is more money for uh, water infrastructure, clean water and drinking, state revolving, revolving loan funds, um, and uh, lots for climate change and resilience. There's even an energy efficiency conservation blocking grant, which should open up more funding opportunities for small cities like Ferndale, as, as well as the surface transportation block grant, which um, opens up more money for transportation projects to small cities. Small cities like Ferndale are in the donut hole where we're not large enough to get federal dollars um, in, in a way that bigger cities do. So this is one of the goals of the policy reform that more cities um, didn't have to jump through hoops through their state debt to get federal dollars to, uh, to do uh, local transportation projects. Um, and then finally, the environment, um, more money for the Brownfield program and uh, hazardous substance super fund programs. And I know this is all great for communities in Michigan, particularly broadband access, where our, a lot of our cities and rural areas in Michigan just don't have adequate broadband and people cannot access um, the economic opportunities that um, we have um, maybe more in urban areas. So anyway, I just wanted to say how important these were. I pay attention um, positioning Ferndale to get money from these grants is important to me because that's how we move things forward when we don't have enough. Um, and those are strategic positioning that I look at um, when, we, when we take on new policy directions and council resolutions. Um, to me, I say, is that gonna get us more grant money? And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say tonight. Um, thanks for paying attention tonight and being involved and coming and, uh, and uh, asking us questions. So uh, with that, I'm ending the meeting at, my computer says 9.17, but that clock says 10.15. I am totally <laughs> off. What time is it? It is really 9.17. I thought it was an hour later in here, folks. Um, with that, good night. Good night, everyone.